Plato, the Story of a Cat by A. S. Downs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Plato, the Story of a Cat by A. S. Downs One day last summer, a large, handsome black cat walked gravely up one side of Main Street, crossed, and went halfway down the other. He stopped at a house called The Den, went up the piazza steps, and paused by an open window. The lady sitting inside saw and spoke to him, but without taking any notice, he put his paws on the sill, looked around the rooms as if wondering if it would suit him, and finally gazed into her face. After thinking a minute, he went in, and from that hour took his place as an important member of the family. Civil to all, he gives his love only to the lady whom he first saw, and it is odd to see, as he lies by the fire, how he listens to all the conversation, but raises his head only when she speaks and drops it again when she has finished with a pleased air no other person in the house is so wise for he alone never makes a mistake the hours he selects for his exercise are the sunniest the carpet he lies upon the softest and he knows the moment he enters the room whether his friend will let him lie in her lap or whether because of her best gown she will have none of him no one at the den can tell how he came to be called Plato. It is a fact that he answers to the name, and when asked if so known before he came there, smiles wisely. What matters it, the smile says, how I was called or where I came from, since I am Plato and am here. He dislikes noise and entirely disapproves sweeping. A broom and a dustpan fill him with anxiety, and he seeks the soft cushions of the big lounge. But when these in their turn are beaten and tossed about, he retreats to the study table. However, as soon as he learned that once a week his favorite room was turned into chaos, he sought another refuge, and refuses to get up that day until noon. Many were the speculations as to Plato's Christmas present. All were satisfied with a rattan basket, just large enough for him to lie in, and a light open canopy, cushions of cardinal chintz, and a cardinal satin bow, to which was fastened a lovely card. It was set before Plato, and although it is probable that it was the first he had ever seen, he showed neither surprise nor curiosity but looked at it loftily, as if such a retreat should have been given him long ago. For could not any discerning person see he was accustomed to luxury? He stepped in carefully and curled himself gracefully upon the soft cushions, the glowing tints of which were very becoming to his sable beauty. It was soon seen that Plato was very fond of his basket, and was unwilling to share it in the smallest degree when little Betsy put her doll in, just to see if the cardinal was becoming to her. He looked so stern, and walked so fiercely toward them, that the doll's heart sank within her. And Betsy said, Please excuse us, Plato. If balls and toys were carelessly dropped there, he would push them out without delay. And if visitors took up the basket to examine it, he would fix his eyes upon them, thinking, Oh, yes, you would pick pockets or steal the spoons if I did not watch you. As his conduct can never be predicted, great was the curiosity when one cold afternoon he was noticed walking up the avenue while a miserable yellow kitten dragged herself after him. She was so thin you could count her bones, and she had been so pulled and kicked that there seemed to be nothing of her but length and dirt. 
When Lord Plato chooses, he enters the front doors, but as he waits no man's pleasure, unless it pleases him first, he has a way of getting in on his own account. Upon one of the shed doors is an old-fashioned latch, which by jumping he can reach and lift with his paw. Having opened the door, he pushed his poor yellow straggler in, and followed himself. She lay down at once upon the floor, and Plato began washing her with his rough tongue, while the lookers-on assisted his hospitality by bringing a saucer of milk. While she ate, Plato rested, looking as pleased as if he were her mother at her enjoyment. The luncheon finished, the washing was resumed, and as the waif was now able to help, she soon looked more respectable. But Plato had not finished his work of mercy. He looked at the door leading to the parlor, then at her, and finally bent down tenderly to her little torn ears, as if whispering. But she would not move. Perhaps in all her wretched life she had never been so comfortable, and believed in letting well enough alone. Reason and persuasion alike useless, Plato concluded to try force and taking her by the back of the neck, carried her through the house and dropped her close to his dainty, cherished basket. Then he appeared a little uncertain what to do. The basket was nice and warm. He was tired and cold. It had been a present to him. The street wanderer was dirty still, and the rug would be a softer bed than she had ever known. Were these his thoughts? And was it selfishness he conquered, when at last he lifted the shivering, homeless creature into his own beautiful nest? The End of Plato, The Story of a Cat by A. S. Down